We've all heard of the Sahara. Sure you have. It's the largest hot desert on the planet. A sea of sand covering an area larger than the contiguous United States. But have you ever wondered what lies beneath the sand dunes? To answer this question, we must travel deep into the past of our blue planet. Up until some 6,000 years ago, the Sahara was grassland. Humans were around at this time, not me, spreading agriculture around the planet. In the north of Africa, the color green dominated. Plenty of rainfall meant that there were lakes, rivers, pastures, and even forests. A completely different image of the Sahara from the barren landscape of today. But then, the climate started to shift. The region became parched, and the vegetation started disappearing. The wind did the rest. It took away the fine sediment after there were no plant roots to hold the ground together. Give it a couple thousands of years, and you get a familiar image of the Sahara. Sand and rocks stretching as far as the eye can see. But when it comes to volume, only a quarter of the Sahara is actually sand. The yellow sands of the Sahara are just one part of the story. The desert has many other features, such as gravel plains, salt flats, and plateaus. Makes you think if we understand the word desert correctly. For people who study such terrains, geologists, there is only one condition for defining a desert – precipitation. If an area gets little or no rain, then it's considered a desert. The Sahara certainly fits the bill. Its average annual rainfall is just 3 inches. Compare that to the nearly 45 inches a year in New York. When we look at precipitation, this sandy desert is only the third largest in the world. Number one and two are Antarctica and the Arctic. They are larger than the Sahara by millions of square miles. It sounds odd, but there is more than one type of desert. The first two are polar deserts, while the Sahara is a subtropical desert. But the difference in air temperature are staggering. In Antarctica's interior, temperatures plummet to minus 76 degrees Fahrenheit. Compare that to the highest temperature on record in the Sahara of 136 degrees Fahrenheit. But this desert has a cool side. At night, the temperature is roughly the same as the average yearly temperature in Denmark. This hot and cold roller coaster makes it hard to choose the right outfit when venturing into the Sahara. And what about the sand? How deep is it actually? The depth varies between 70 and 140 feet. That's not too deep. If you put the Statue of Liberty in a tall dune, half of it would still stick out of the sand. Its vast amounts in the Sahara were created by aeolian processes. That's Greek for wind. Over time, it blows and shapes the surface of the Earth. In dry areas with sparse vegetation, winds erode the ground much faster. That's what happened in North Africa. Under all that sand is the bedrock and cracked clay. If you started digging, you would find the same everywhere on the planet, with one important difference. There is some type of soil covering the bedrock. This is not the case in the Sahara. Because of the arid climate and a lack of vegetation, sand covers the ground below. Over the course of thousands of years, a lot of interesting finds ended up in the desert sand. For example, there are petrified tree trunks. These are essentially preserved prehistoric trees. They date back to the time when the region was lush green. In some places, the trees of this fossilized forest are at least 65 feet tall. The wood is so well preserved that you can still see the texture and knots. There are even fossilized pine cones. In 1992, scientists found glass fragments in eastern Sahara. These canary yellow glass shards were scattered across hundreds of miles. They didn't belong to an ancient civilization. Although ancient Egyptians used them to make jewelry. In fact, the breastplate of King Tut had a beautiful scarab beetle centerpiece made from this desert glass. For a long time, scientists were puzzled about the true origins of these fragments. They finally concluded that the glass was around 29 million years old. It is an impact tape. If that sounds like it has something to do with the word impact, you are correct. These rocks are formed when a meteorite hits the surface of the Earth. This generates a lot of heat. 
Scientists estimate that the temperature needed to melt this mineral was close to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Apart from the regular fine-grained sand, we also have melted sand in the Sahara. But the desert conceals other unlikely artifacts. Shark teeth are a common find in Morocco, which sits in the western part of the Sahara. What are the fossilized teeth of these marine predators doing in the middle of the desert? This part of the world looked entirely different millions of years ago. There was a sea cutting right through what is now a desert. The Trans-Saharan Seaway ran the length of present-day Algeria and Mali. It was around 165 feet deep. That was enough for all sorts of aquatic animals to inhabit it. Large catfish, sea snakes, and of course sharks lived in the area. British archaeologists even unearthed a turtle shell in Mali in the 1980s. For centuries, there was even an entire city hidden under the desert. Timgad was a Roman outpost constructed by the Emperor Trajan around the year 100 in the current era. For various reasons, its residents abandoned it around the year 700. The sands of the Sahara soon engulfed the city. It had remained hidden for nearly a thousand years. Then, in the 1700s, a Scottish explorer started digging out the city. His team first uncovered a sandstone triumphal arch 40 feet high, similar to the ones we can see in Rome and Paris today. An amphitheater soon popped out of the sand, and it was followed by well-preserved statues of Roman emperors. The Scotsman's find was so impressive that no one believed him at first. It took two more centuries for archaeologists to fully excavate the city during the 1950s. The site covers a surface as large as 10 polo fields. The ruins reveal the full mastery of Roman city planning. All the streets meet at a right angle in what is known as an orthogonal grid. You can find the same layout in modern cities such as New York. Historians estimate that during its heyday, 10,000 people called Timgad home. Different nationalities lived here, from Romans to people of African descent. Today, more than 2.5 million people live in and around the Sahara. They are spread across 11 countries in total, and their living space is growing. The desert is 10% larger than it was just a century ago. This process doesn't involve sand pouring out of the Sahara. The ecosystems on the edges of the desert simply change over time. The wind blows the soil away and vegetation dwindles, the perfect conditions for the formation of a desert landscape. These changes are happening in the Sahel, a region south of the Sahara Desert. That's why the African countries have recently come together for a project called the Great Green Wall. The primary goal is to stop the desertification of the Sahel and hold back the sands of the Sahara. Their plan is ambitious and involves planting a wall of trees from the west to the east of the African continent. The proposed forest is not only going to be long, but wide as well. The Sahara and the Sahel share a historic bond. Since antiquity, camel caravans have been making the journey from Africa's Mediterranean coast in the north to the savannas in the south. The golden age of this trade kicked off in the 9th century. The perilous journey took several months to complete. The route was two and a half times longer than the length of the Grand Canyon. Explorers still find evidence of these ancient caravans hidden away under the sands of the Sahara. So the Sahara Desert is so big that it covers 8% of the world's territory. It's bigger than the USA or China. Surprisingly, the Sahara is not the largest desert in the world. It is the third largest, behind Antarctica and the Arctic. But it is definitely the hottest one. Temperatures there reach 136 degrees Fahrenheit. This place has some of the most incredible sand dunes you've ever seen, towering up to 1,476 feet. But here's the kicker. There's a real risk that these dunes might continue to spread until they cover the entire world. Surprisingly, the influence of the Sahara Desert extends far beyond its borders. Its dust, carried by powerful winds, makes its way to the UK and across the European continent, particularly in winter. This dust, settling on the ground where it rains, 
is a familiar sight to those in the UK, often leaving a red residue on cars. This connection between the Sahara, England, and Europe serves as a stark reminder of the global reach of environmental phenomena. You might think this is not a big deal, but it could turn Europe into a desert, leaving its soil infertile and Europeans with no food. Soil is a fundamental aspect of human existence, just as crucial as clean water and air. Without it, we're left with nothing but a bleak and barren landscape. The Sahara Desert has already made its jump across the Mediterranean Sea, which is concerning and could change the landscape forever. One-fifth of Spain has already turned into a desert. The next victim is Italy, which also faces the problem of desertification. In fact, almost all European countries have the same issue. According to an expert, the land that has not changed for nearly 2,000 years will become mostly rock and people living on this land will be gone. 60% of the soil in Moldova is gone, and the problem has expanded beyond the Black Sea. It has reached China and Mongolia, thousands of miles away from the Sahara Desert. All of this causes losses of $4 billion a year. The threat is so significant that even the UN has gathered the necessary resources to solve the problem as soon as possible. Italy is sending help to Africa to stop the Sahara Desert from expanding. If this process does not stop in the next 10 years, millions will be forced to leave their homes. The Sahara Desert is growing for approximately 30 miles per decade. You do the math and see how long it will take to cover Europe. Since 1920, the Sahara has expanded by around 10%. But not all hope is lost because more than 172 countries have joined to put a stop to the desertification of the world. The World Food Program is a project that aims to help bring back green land that was once present in the Sahara. When they told people who called the Sahara home what they were about to do, the latter basically laughed in their faces and said it was impossible. But when you have a specific goal in mind, the impossible becomes possible. If we traveled back around 5,000 years into the past, we would see a beautiful forest with lush green trees and grass. Africa's climate has been changing for 21,000 years, from fantastic greenery to uninhabitable deserts. This has to do with Earth's rotation and the monsoons that bring water to this dry continent. But with the help of scientists and some clever tricks, we can bring the greenery back and stop the Sahara in its tracks. The Senegal River serves as a border between the Sahara Desert, Senegal City, and Mauritania. When you look at this area from space, you'll see how the desert is expanding to Senegal because the vegetation along the riverbank is almost non-existent. Forests can serve as a barrier, stopping the sand from getting blown away and the desert from expanding. An effort to create a great green wall is being made, and how they do it is actually quite impressive. Nothing has been growing in the currently restored area for more than 40 years, making locals find other places to call home. People were thrilled when they saw that the land could be restored. They're very committed and learn to work with the soil and grow food. At the same moment, more than 30,000 hectares have been restored and transformed into lush greenery. The Sahel region is the starting point of desertification, and it is crucial to establish a green wall in that area first. To make this wall is not rocket science, since it only takes a few simple steps. The ground there is baked by the sun and as hard as a block of concrete. If you've ever poured water on concrete, you know that it just flows away. It doesn't stay in one place. So they had to create water-retaining half-moons that would hold the water and make it available to plants. When you learn about how these half-moons work, you might say, how did they not think of that sooner? Actually, this technique is ancient, and it was once implemented in Sahel, but it was lost over time. When the rain falls, the water is collected into the half-moons that are positioned a bit lower than the ground below contour lines. There is also a kind of bank at the end of the shape that prevents water from overflowing. And in the middle, there are plants that are happy because they have plenty of water to thrive. 
Also, it's essential to grow native plants that are kind of used to harsh conditions, like sorghum and millet. These plants have been surviving there for thousands of years and produce a good amount of biomass, which means the land can be rehabilitated faster and people will have food sooner. The water that will enter the half-moons won't be lost. It will penetrate the ground and top off underground waters. This will ensure the ground that H2O will never run out and that future generations will have usable aqua. This brilliant planting technique is not limited to half-moons. People also create lines and plant various vegetables, such as tomatoes. Next, there are places only for trees, like lemons or oranges. After a long, hot day, nothing is better than a freshly made cold lemonade. The trees will also protect the soil, and with some luck, there will be a new forest in the Sahara Desert. The goal is to copy the forest dynamic. Start with small plants and gradually expand to bigger plants that are more useful than the tiny ones. They are aiming to plant more than 10,000 trees. Right now, many people are leaving the Sahara after the rainy season, going to cities or leaving Africa altogether. At this time of year, villages are like ghost towns. Only animals can be found there. Most people are gone. I mean, who would blame them? Nobody wants to live in the sand where nothing grows. Luckily, with all this new, old technology being developed, many people are slowly but surely returning to their land and starting to work in agriculture. The best thing is that there are no brutal winters, so plants grow 12 months a year, and people can always have food. People are becoming more social because now everybody stays in their villages and doesn't travel much. If this project works out, Africa will be saved, and the world won't turn into a giant desert. A comfortable abode with a gorgeous view of the Mediterranean Sea will serve as a perfect rain shelter. Well, this is what a real estate advertisement might have looked like for Neanderthals 100,000 years ago. Welcome to the weird and wonderful caves you could live in. Or not. Of course, back then, neither real estate and advertising had been invented yet. Never mind the fact that Neanderthals couldn't build houses and often lived in caves. Yet, one of those caves looks an awful lot like a residential building. It's situated inside a high limestone cape called the Rock of Gibraltar. If the Neanderthals had had an economy, the caves inside this rock would have cost a bundle. Navigators discovered it in 1907. They just spotted a big hole inside the fortified rock. For many years, scientists have studied this place and found some traces of Neanderthals. They discovered ancient tools in the cave and bones of old animals. But the coolest thing was, they found four caves inside the rock. It was like a residential complex. Neanderthals lived alongside neighbors and helped each other hunt and fish. They created feather decorations and painted abstract drawings on the walls. Imagine our ancient predecessors hanging out in these caves 100,000 years ago. And now, scientists hang out there and study the primeval past of Neanderthals in detail. At the end of 2021, archaeologists uncovered a gap inside one of the caves leading to an unknown tunnel. They crawled through this hole and opened a new space under the cave roof. This place has been closed off from the outside world for over 40,000 years. And it seems it was one of the most prestigious apartments in the entire mountain complex. It has high ceilings with ancient stalactites. The ruined stone curtains divided the apartment into several rooms. Scientists also found the remains of ancient animals and scratches on the walls. It seems that Neanderthals had never lived here, but they used to visit this place. Archaeologists found the shell of a sea snail called dog whelk. One of the Neanderthals brought it here for some reason. But the primary owners of this place were hyenas. These caves show that Neanderthals were closer to humans than to monkeys. They had a way of life and even some customs. There's still a lot of work ahead, and scientists hope to find new rooms inside this rock. Meanwhile, in 2003, archaeologists discovered another early dwelling on the Isle of Flores in Indonesia. Among the green jungle, they found a cave with ancient tools. At first, everyone thought the human ancestors lived here. But then, scientists discovered an unusual skeleton of an adult. A thorough analysis showed the skeleton belonged to a 30-year-old woman. 
three and a half feet tall, just above the waist of an average adult. The woman's weight was equal to the weight of an adult shepherd. The skeleton didn't belong to Neanderthals or Australopithecines. It was a new unknown species, which scientists called Homo floresiensis, or simply the hobbit. Also, there were remains of unusual ancient animals in the cave. It was an elephant the size of a cow, some large storks, and giant rats. Archaeologists have found out that hobbits were not the owners of this place. The main inhabitants were the rats the size of a cat. Maybe they were fighting the hobbits. Some analysis shows that Homo florensiensis wasn't our direct ancestor. They were in a separate branch of evolution. The hobbit skeleton looks more like that of a monkey than of modern humans. In 2009, in the dense jungle of Vietnam, archaeologists discovered San Don, the largest cave in the world. If you go inside the cave and shout, you'll hear your echo a long time. In some places, the height of this cave reaches half the height of the Empire State Building. And the total area is larger than one central block of New York. Sun Don is one of the three caves in the Vietnamese jungle. Many intricate mazes connect these caves. Inside, you can find unique plants and trees that live separately from the outside world. It's a real underground jungle. In some places, you can find collapsed ceilings that let the sunlight in. Besides unusual trees and plants, ancient stalactites hang there. Some limestone deposits are more than 450 million years old. They were here even before dinosaurs appeared. There are also many rivers in the cave. Rainwater coming down from holes in the ceiling has formed them. Fast streams resemble slides in a water park. They lead to unknown underground labyrinths. Scientists have studied only a small part of all these caves. The next unusual cave is in New Zealand. Hundreds of thousands of fireflies live inside. Each of them glows with a blue light. Together, they light up the cave. It may seem to you that you're on another planet, but you can't stay there for a long time. Special air measuring devices are everywhere. Scientists monitor the level of carbon dioxide necessary for the normal existence of fireflies. These insects are sensitive to the environment. If there are many people in the cave, or they stay there too long, the park staff will ask them to leave the place. It's like you're literally stealing oxygen from the fireflies. We've seen some pretty amazing caves so far, but how about a scary one? We're going to the desert of Yemen's Almara province. What we're looking for is not a cave. It's just a black hole in the ground, right in the middle of the desert. It's big, the size of a basketball court. It's not its size that can scare you, but what's inside. Scientists are still not sure what it is. From the depths of this black abyss, a disgusting smell of rotten eggs constantly comes out. And sometimes, you can hear some strange, frightening sounds. The blackness of the giant hole in Yemen absorbs all the sun's rays, so you won't see what's there even with a powerful flashlight. People flew over this place by helicopter. They filmed using drones and the most powerful lenses, but they didn't catch anything except darkness. It looks like a big ink spot in the middle of golden sand. The locals are afraid to approach this place. They believe the cave leads to another dimension where evil creatures live. At the moment, the giant hole in Yemen is one of the most poorly studied and mysterious phenomenon of nature. How did it appear? How old is it? Where does it lead? Scientists are trying to find the answers to these questions. There are theories that the hole appeared because of construction work. Geologists drilled the soil nearby in search of minerals. It could have caused fluctuations in the Earth's crust and collapsed the surface. But no one can prove this theory. Yet. And now, imagine a place where sunlight has not penetrated for more than 5 million years. There's little oxygen, and it's cold and damp. Still, life is born in this place. Not only microbes and bacteria, but also something bigger. The living conditions in this cave are very different from the usual ones. So, in a sense, this cave is like another planet. It's the Movil Cave in the southeast of Romania, near the Black Sea. The entrance is a small hole in the ground. Inside, a tunnel leads deep below the surface. The levels of hydrogen sulfide and carbon dioxide are above normal inside the cave. The air here is half as much oxygen as on the surface. People can't be here without an oxygen mask. But other creatures living here can. 
the cave is home to 48 species of living organisms. 33 of them are unknown. Here, you can meet some unusual insects. White snails and white spiders, millipedes with huge whiskers, transparent shrimp, and unique species of leeches. They all live here thanks to the little bacteria autotrophs. They absorb carbon dioxide and release food particles. Bacteria feed on it. Other larger organisms feed on these bacteria, and some bigger organisms eat those little ones. In the end, everyone gets food. In this cave, evolution has created a biological system separate from the rest of the world. Phew! This summer has been turning up the heat like never before. We feel like roasted marshmallows on a sizzling grill. Yes, the world is getting hotter, but some regions have always fought with high temperatures. It turns out people had some inventions to keep themselves cool in ancient times, too. Some of them are still functioning, even 3,000 years later. Let's take a look at how people saved themselves from heat throughout history. So, put an ice cube into your cold drink and get ready to hear how people survived the heat. Speaking of ice cubes, do you know that the Persians made an ice storage system? In the deserts of ancient Persia, people had an out-of-the-box idea about how to prevent their food from turning into a melted mess. These ingenious Persians stumbled upon a physics trick that allowed them to create ice in the middle of the desert. They called these cool structures yakchals, which basically means ice pits. These ice pits were not your ordinary coolers. They were like secret underground fridges. They looked like dome-shaped mud brick structures on the outside, but inside, it was a whole different world. These ice pits had an evaporation cooler system that worked like magic. At night, when the desert cooled down, Persians made use of the radiative cooling effect. They set up cleverly designed trenches to hold thin layers of water. The water froze, defying the desert heat. Then there were underground square storage areas. The Persians collected the melting ice water from these cool trenches, and during the night, they froze it again making the most of the desert's natural chill. To add to the cooling effect, they built a wall to shade the storage areas from the hot midday sun. And that's not all. They had this fantastic wind-catching contraption called a badger that caught the breeze and directed it right into the ice pits. Fresh air plus ice. Cool breeze. A winning combo. They even had intricate water channels called kanats to bring water to the ice pits and homes all the way from the nearby mountains. As time passed, these yakchals faded into history and modern technology took over. But hey, there's good news too. Some awesome folks in Iran are restoring these ancient coolers. So, if you ever find yourself in the desert, don't forget to pay a visit to these marvelous places and witness the genius of the ancient Persians firsthand. Now, I want to focus more on the wind catchers because they don't just help make ice cubes. They actually function as a cooling system as well. Back in the day, those clever architectural wonders were all the rage in places like Persia, modern-day Iran, Egypt, and the Middle East. Imagine tower-like structures with openings at various levels strategically placed to harness the power of nature's breeze. These openings were like magical portals for the wind. They captured those refreshing gusts and guided them right into people's living spaces. Basically, they were natural air conditioners. The breeze would gracefully flow downward, cooling the ground as it danced through the building. The secret sauce lies in the details. The tower's height, the number of sides, the openings, and the positioning of the interior blades. Everything plays its role in how efficiently the wind towers work out. Thanks to these wind catchers, ancient societies could enjoy comfy indoor temperatures without sweating. Can you imagine living in those times? Feeling the gentle breeze whisking through your home, keeping you feeling fresh and chilled out? The Persians are often credited for inventing these awesome wind catchers. But hey, don't forget about Egypt. There, you can find traces of similar structures dating all the way back to 1300 BCE. Yes, 
The invention of wind catchers may have occurred in ancient Egypt, but Yazid in Iran is the city with the largest number of wind catchers. People wouldn't have been able to live there without these ancient ACs because there was almost no rain in the area throughout the year. Now, let's look at these perforated double-skinned exteriors. Imagine dressing up a building with a fancy perforated screen. It's like giving its exterior a stylish makeover while keeping things chill inside. This genius technique, firstly, scatters the natural daylight, so no harsh sunbeams to blind you. The screen also offers shade like a pro, giving the building's interior a much needed break from the blazing sun. Think of it as a natural sun hat for your home. Placing this screen about four feet away from the outer walls creates a breezy, dreamy hallway for fresh air circulation. And hey, they add a touch of elegance to the building too. These structures are sometimes called Jali. Jaipur, India, for example, has an average daytime temperature of about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So these structures are lifesavers. Jalis come in various forms, crafted from cement, earth, and wood. It's a cultural symbol deeply embedded in Indian architecture. You can find its captivating presence in iconic historical buildings like the majestic Taj Mahal and the Grand Red Fort in Delhi. But hey, it's not just a thing of the past. It's still rocking modern architecture scenes and its charm has sparked creativity in artists and designers worldwide. It adorns the building's exterior its cross-section showing a larger opening on the outside and a smaller one on the inside. This is where the Venturi effect steps in to show off its physics prowess. As the air flows through the narrowing passage, it picks up speed, creating a difference in pressure between the inside and outside of the building. Air blowing at a higher speed gets compressed, and when released, it cools down. Mashrabia is a wooden lattice or screen used in the Middle East and North Africa. These decorative wonders are like window blinds, but they do more than just look pretty. They're smart too. They give privacy, shading you from the sun, and let fresh air and light in. Some people also add clay pots filled with water, sand, or damp straw to their designs. As hot air breezes through the holes, it also passes through the pot's porous surface. The moisture inside evaporates, cooling the air. This is a perfect low-cost technique for hot and dry climates. It's eco-friendly, and there's no need for electricity. Now, let's fast forward to today. Designers are getting creative, mixing traditional wisdom with modern tech. At the Al-Bahar Towers in Abu Dhabi, they've got it too. Picture over 2,000 hexagonal panels that dance with the sun's movement, providing shade to the building's interior. Water evaporation was another secret weapon for ancient people. Simple, yet super effective. Plus, ancient Egyptians hung wet mats and curtains in doorways. When the air passed through them, it cooled down, providing a relief from the scorching sun. Ancient architects were the masters of maximizing airflow. They knew how to cross-ventilate and let hot air escape while inviting cooler air to the party. Speaking of ancient Rome, bathhouses were the place to be back then. It was like a community hub. People gathered to chat about politics, play sports, and, of course, take a relaxing dip. The Frigidarium was the cool spot in Roman baths. After a steamy soak in the Caldarium, Romans dashed to this giant pool to chill out. Then in some places, like Cappadocia in Turkey, people went underground to hide from the heat. They carved cozy dwellings in volcanic rock, harnessing the Earth's natural cooling powers. So the lesson here is simple. Architects and designers can create wonders by combining local traditions with smart tech. California's Death Valley boasts the highest officially registered temperature to date, with 134 degrees Fahrenheit in 1913. Meanwhile, Africa's sweltering record stands at 131 degrees Fahrenheit in Kebeli, Tunisia, as noted in 1931. In Europe, the highest temperature ever documented reached almost 120 degrees Fahrenheit in Sicily in August 2021. 
Then, in 2022, the UK had the hottest summer of all time. You find yourself in Africa, land of unique wildlife, home to a great variety of cultures and languages, and, first and foremost, host to the world's largest hot desert, the Sahara. It's daytime, and you are thirsty for some water and shade. You've been walking for days, trying to find one of those precious-looking oases. You feel you're near, but the horizon just keeps stretching and stretching. Your mind is tired, and your body is feeling all the heat. It's like you've eaten a full plate of hot pepper and then some more, judging by how much you're sweating. And when I say hot, think 100 degrees Fahrenheit hot on average. No wonder this is happening. After all, you find yourself in the world's biggest hot desert. Now I say hot desert since the biggest deserted landscapes are actually the cold ones, located in Antarctica and the Arctic. I see Antarctica's frozen desert is more or less the size of 1 million LAXs. Yep, the Los Angeles International Airport. The Arctic Desert is just a bit smaller than that. Now, in case you don't know, the Sahara Desert is located in northern Africa, stretching from the Atlantic Ocean all the way over to the Red Sea. It occupies an area large enough to place approximately 100,000 Disney World theme parks side by side. According to scientists, its boundaries are expanding. Deserts usually form in the subtropics because of what's called Hadley circulation. The air rises at the equator and descends into the subtropics. This circulation of air has a drying effect, which helps the formation of desert landscapes. Since the 1920s, the Sahara is considered to have expanded by over 10%. How is this happening? Well, let's start from the beginning. You probably know the Sahara Desert as one of the most inhospitable places on Earth today. Just FYI, for a place to be considered a desert, it has to receive less than 4 inches of rain per year. Due to the very small precipitation index, deserts are usually dry and arid places. There is little humidity in the air, and daytime temperatures can go as high as 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Usually, there isn't that much animal and plant life because of the lack of water. But in the Sahara's case, it wasn't always like that. It may be difficult to imagine northern Africa without the tons of sand it has today. But about 20,000 years ago, the Sahara was actually one big oasis. Recent discoveries show clear evidence of what the scientists now call the Green Sahara. In the mid-1800s, a German explorer crossing the Sahara encountered some paintings and engravings that nomad artists had left behind. What he saw in those paintings looked nothing like his actual surroundings. Instead of an arid landscape with only camels and desert vegetation, the rock paintings depicted jungle animals like giraffes and hippos. There were even images of livestock and grazing animals such as cattle and sheep, something that seems impossible for modern-day Sahara. Artists usually draw what they see around them, so this finding really intrigued the German explorer. The drawings were so detailed that the artists must have had close contact with those animals. You can find this rock art spread out in the northern part of the African continent, from Western Sahara to Saudi Arabia. Geologists soon took a keen interest in this and found the first clues to what this could mean. They have been able to confirm that, in fact, northern Africa was once much wetter. They found evidence from nearby deep-sea sediment off the coast of Mauritania. Sampled cores of underwater sand and mud, known as Saharan dust flux, show geologists that, indeed, a green Sahara was possible. The more dust is blowing off of the desert and into the bottom of the ocean, the drier the climate in the region. The sediment cores show that there was much less dust, only half as much, coming off northern Africa during the humid period. This period has to do with Earth's natural cycles. Normally, the Earth rotates at a tilt of 23.5 degrees. But this angle is not consistent and changes over time. Earth's tilt is responsible for the amount of sunlight each hemisphere receives. It affects several ecosystem functions on the planet. During the time of the Green Sahara, the Earth received between 4 and 8% more sunlight than it does today. So when the Earth tilted about 20,000 years ago, the northern hemisphere received more direct sunlight which affected humidity levels in the region. As the northern hemisphere got warmer, this affected monsoon activity, more specifically, the West African monsoon. Monsoons are wind systems that affect a region's rainfall index and humidity levels. 
As a part of the globe gets warmer, it allows for more air to rise. It combines with the wind to draw moisture up into the atmosphere. Little by little, northern Africa also became wetter. The increased moisture made the Sahara so wet that there were actual bodies of water in the region. As vegetation grew, the plants held on to moisture better than bare sand could. There is evidence of natural basins throughout the Sahara and lakes so big they would fit all of the U.S.'s Great Lakes inside of them. Archaeologists uncovered evidence of vibrant societies in what are now arid areas. It looks like ancient cultures were able to take full advantage of the African humid period. According to researchers, the human population peaked across the Sahara about 9,000 years ago. There are traces of fireplaces, hunting tools, fish hooks, and even mounds of fish bones. Records show that there have been over 230 green periods over the span of 8 million years. Solar radiation is always changing due to natural orbital cycles. That's why Earth will most certainly see another green Sahara moment. It might be thousands of years from now, but it will happen. The same way the Sahara turns green, it turns yellow again. Let's put it like that. All it takes is a significant axial tilt and a few years of readjusting. However, another phenomenon is calling the attention of scientists now. Recent studies by the National Science Foundation from the University of Maryland show the Sahara has expanded 10% over the past 90 years. This phenomenon is called desertification, which literally means fertile land turning into desert land. The Sahara Desert is now advancing into the semi-arid region of Sahel. In 1950, this region was home to 31 million people. Today, its population is over 100 million people. This rapid population growth has largely contributed to the Sahara's expansion. Farmers that were once nomads began settling down. Land usage grew more intense, aiding and weakening the soil. The demand for food has caused an overcropping of the land, so even more of it is turning into the desert now. The study also shows that natural climate cycles can affect rainfall in the Sahara and the Sahel. Scientists affirm that all deserts fluctuate, not only the Sahara. A desert's boundary may expand in the dry winter and contract during the wetter summer. South of the Sahara lies the Chad Basin. It is a natural body of water that now serves as an indicator of the Sahara's expansion. The Chad Basin is located in the region where the Sahara is advancing southward. An atmospheric and ocean expert from the University of Maryland explains that rainfall has reduced greatly in the entire region. Due to reduced rainfalls, there is less water across the entire basin, and even Chad Lake is drying out. Just like the Sahara, the Atacama Desert in Chile, deemed the world's driest, is also expanding. It is located north of the city of Santiago, and its southern border is expanding toward the Chilean capital. Because the climate is getting drier and drier here, the city of Santiago is turning into an arid or semi-arid region itself. The once fertile valleys of local rivers that lived on agriculture and livestock for many generations are losing their revenues as Chilean land is turning into a desert. Since 2010, Santiago has received only a third of its annual rainfall. Outside of the city, farmers are digging holes in search of blue gold, or simply put, water. The situation here is very similar to that of Sahel. So tell me this, were you as surprised as I was to find out what has been happening in the Sahara region? Feel free to share in the comments below. In November 1922, a boy walked through the desert mountains of Egypt and discovered some ancient steps carved into the rock. Subsequently, this find became one of the world's largest and most significant archaeological discoveries. This step was part of Tutankhamun's untouched tomb. Archaeologists found about 5,000 ancient objects, including jewelry, fabrics, painted vases, and funeral masks. You've probably seen one of them. It has become one of the most recognizable attributes of ancient Egypt. More than a hundred years have passed since then. And now, humanity has finally become close to another large-scale discovery, the tomb of Cleopatra. This queen was the last active ruler of the Ptolemaic Kingdom of Egypt, who sat on the throne from 51 to 30 BCE. There are many ancient records about Cleopatra, her reign, and her unusual personality. 
But until now, no one has discovered the secrets about her passing away in the burial place. So, one archaeologist, Dr. Kathleen Martinez, has been studying ancient records and temples around Alexandria for decades and concluded that the tomb of the queen should be located under the ancient city of Taposiris Magna, founded in 280 BCE. It was a big city on the northern coast of Egypt where tens of thousands of people were engaged in trade and industry. And it seems that Dr. Martinez's guesses turned out to be correct. She and a group of archaeologists have discovered a secret underground tunnel near Alexandria with a length of about 0.8 miles. It was cut into the rock under Taposiris Magna's temple. During further excavations, they found many things that indicate Cleopatra's tomb lies in the tunnel's depths. It's also possible that she is buried there together with the Roman commander, Mark Antony. According to ancient records, Cleopatra and Mark Antony loved each other and together opposed the Roman Senate, which declared Antony a traitor. The fact that natural disasters have occurred on the territory of Taposiris Magna for thousands of years can complicate the excavations. Earthquakes and floods destroyed the city and possibly flooded its underground tunnels. But archaeologists hope the ancient tomb remains untouched and that it hides many treasures and records about the royal life of ancient Egypt during the reign of the last dynasty. There's a chance that excavations will go underwater and in the mud. This will require much time and funding, but archaeologists are sure it's worth it. Anyway, it's too early to say that Cleopatra is really buried there, but scientists have found many things in the tunnel that confirm this, including clay pots, dozens of coins with the image of Cleopatra and Alexander the Great, as well as a bust with the image of the Egyptian queen. Cleopatra is still one of the most popular personalities in Egypt, on an equal footing with Rameses III and Tutankhamun. She inspired many films, paintings, and books. But what made her so popular? She became famous for her inconsistency. She was a beautiful, intelligent ruler who pulled Egypt out of the crisis and made it a prosperous power. Medieval Arabic texts say she knew chemistry, mathematics, and philosophy, and may have written several scientific books. She knew several languages and had excellent diplomatic skills. At the same time, there are many legends that she was a femme fatale who drove many men crazy. However, there's no evidence that her beauty was incomparable. The image of a stunning model was created by Hollywood when it made several films where famous actresses performed the role of Cleopatra. And the Roman Emperor Octavian, the adopted son of Julius Caesar, specially created the image of Cleopatra as an insidious seductress because he was her enemy. Even though she was born in Egypt, Cleopatra wasn't an Egyptian. Her ancestors were Greeks, among whom was one of the generals of Alexander the Great. However, the people of Egypt loved her. She learned the language and was very sensitive to the traditions of this country. She knew the history, mentality, and customs of ancient Egypt well. She raised the level of its economy and strengthened its status as a world power. Much of this was made possible thanks to her cunning and impressiveness. She loved theatrical performances and lavish celebrations. She knew how to surprise people and put on a show. But behind the exterior image of a luxury lover was an intelligent and calculating ruler. Ancient Egypt was a rich, luxurious country and Cleopatra did everything to increase its wealth and strengthen its position in the international arena. For example, she was once in conflict with her brother Ptolemy XIII Odd. The queen knew that she wouldn't be able to resist him, so she decided to attract Julius Caesar to their side. The Roman emperor arrived in Alexandria, where Cleopatra wanted to meet him, but Ptolemy knew about her plans and was about to prevent her from coming to Caesar. Then, instead of a rich and noisy arrival, Cleopatra decided to make her visit inconspicuous. She wrapped herself in a carpet or linen bag the emperor's servants carried into Caesar's private chambers. Cleopatra emerged from the carpet and impressed the Roman emperor with her beauty and determination. As a result, they fell in love with each other and became close allies. After some time, she impressed another influential Roman for diplomatic purposes. She arrived to meet Mark Antony on a golden barge with purple sails and silver oars. Cleopatra was dressed in the image of Aphrodite and sat under a magnificent canopy. 
Her servants dressed like cupids and were blowing her fan and burning incense. But Cleopatra created such a show for a reason. She knew that Antony revered Greek mythology and considered himself the embodiment of Dionysus. As a result, he was so impressed with this woman that he ended up marrying her. Cleopatra defended her crown, strengthened her alliance with Rome, and bore Antony three children. In Egypt, they threw big parties and enjoyed wealth with power. However, the relationship of a high-ranking official with the Egyptian queen caused a scandal in Rome. Octavian was Antony's primary opponent in the struggle for power, so he exploited the situation to darken the competitor's reputation. He used propaganda to make Cleopatra an insidious seductress in the eyes of Roman citizens. He accused Antony of succumbing to her charms. The Roman Senate supported Octavian and declared Cleopatra an enemy. In 33 BCE, this conflict reached a high point when Antony's navy clashed with Octavian's fleet. The latter won and forced his enemy to flee to Egypt with Cleopatra. According to some records, they took refuge near Alexandria. Pursued by the Romans, they hid in one of Cleopatra's palaces and met their end. Some legends say that Cleopatra was an expert in poisons. She provoked a venomous snake, a viper or an Egyptian cobra, to bite her. Also, according to another legend, she pricked herself with a poisonous needle. There's a theory that Cleopatra always carried an ampule with poison inside her hairbrush. And when she was cornered, she soaked the needle with this poison and pricked herself. None of this can be said for sure. Scientists are still trying to find out the truth. Perhaps when they reach Cleopatra's tomb, the world will get more answers about her tragic fate. She is considered the last ruler of Egypt. After her passing, Octavian plundered her palaces and temples and returned to Rome, where he became the main emperor. He successfully ruled the country and expanded its borders. His reign ended when he turned 75. World history would have looked different if Cleopatra and Mark Antony hadn't lost that naval battle. By the way, did you know that more time has passed between Cleopatra's reign and Neil Armstrong's flight to the moon than between the reign of the Egyptian queen and the construction of the Great Pyramid of Giza? Armstrong took a step on the Earth's satellite in 1969, 2038 years after the birth of Cleopatra. And the construction of the pyramid took place in 2560 BCE. Imagine how long the history of ancient Egypt is. Cleopatra is closer to us in time than to the pyramids. So, imagine you're 15 and you get bored of playing video games. Instead, to pass the time, you decide to give some attention to an old hobby of yours, tracking down lost Mayan cities. You've heard that some ancient civilizations are said to have built entire cities based on constellations, so you decide to check out whether that was true for the Mayans. You find a book containing all the constellations the Mayan civilization believed to exist. You open good old Google Maps and map every ancient Mayan city discovered today. You start seeing that this information actually matches. And truly, the biggest ancient Mayan cities correspond to the brightest and biggest stars of the Mayan constellations. Okay, this is getting interesting. You manage to map out over 100 ancient cities when you suddenly notice something strange. There's an area in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico where archaeologists have unearthed two Mayan cities. But on the constellation map, there are three stars. Could this mean there is a long-lost city waiting to be discovered nearby? You might think this sounds too daydreamy, but the story is actually true. The previous account happened to a Canadian teenager named William Gaddery. The boy is known as a science genius and had even won an award for the constellation theory we presented just now. When he noticed that a third city was missing from the 23rd constellation he was examining, he began to scour the internet for satellite pictures that could help him solve this mystery. He looked into images from NASA, JAXA, a Japan-based satellite company, and Google Earth. These images were still insufficient to answer his questions. So he reached out to a friend inside the Canadian Space Agency. His friend provided him with state-of-the-art satellite imagery that gave him the answer he was looking for. According to the images, there is a large square area right on the border of Mexico and Belize which looks like the remains of a city. 
William took the images to a remote sensing expert known as Dr. Armin LaRoque from the University of New Brunswick. They studied the images thoroughly and concluded that the area could be housing 30 buildings and even a large pyramid. The scientific and archaeological community went crazy with the 15-year-old's discovery. Could this really be true? Some background. Lost Mayan cities began to be unearthed in the mid-20th century. Since then, ruins from cities such as Tikal, Palenik, and Uxmal have been rediscovered. The Mayans were one of the biggest pre-Columbian civilizations living in the Americas. They began to settle in the area as early as 1500 BCE. Experts believe that, at its height, the Mayan civilization consisted of over 40 cities with a population of millions of people. That's a crowd. And their cities were pretty interesting. Their civilization spanned over Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, Guatemala, and Belize. They survived mainly on agriculture, so they developed a complex irrigation system in most of their cities. They built a series of ceremonial buildings, pyramids, plazas, and even courts for ball games. The Mayans were keen pyramid builders, but they also developed an advanced astronomical system. With whatever ancient technology they had, they were able to predict the exact location of planets, such as Venus and Mars, and they were able to predict the exact dates of eclipses. That's why the methodology William used to discover this long-lost Mayan city was unusual, but not completely surreal. The Mayans were keen astronomers, so it wouldn't be too strange that they built their major architectural feats in relation to the sky, would it? And they wouldn't be the first ones to be doing so. There is a famous fringe of Egyptology dedicated to studying how the Giza pyramids were built in perfect alignment with the Orion constellation, meaning that each pyramid was purposely built to align with one of the major stars of Orion's belt. According to William, he first had the idea to look at the Mayan constellations because he couldn't understand why the Mayans built their cities where they built them. Most major cities, such as Chichen Itza and Uxmal, aren't near any rivers or significant bodies of water. Instead, they're built on marginal lands and on top of mountains, which confused the 15-year-old. His next thought was that it might have something to do with astronomy. William named the new city he discovered Mouth of Fire, which is also my nickname, and he even won a merit award for his hard work. However, his theory was very much contested inside the archaeological community, and many Mayan experts worked to debunk William's findings. Some archaeologists say that constellation theories are too unscientific. Anthony Aveni, a renowned anthropologist and astronomer, referred to William's methodology as an act of creative imagination. He explained that there is no way to be sure what the Mayan constellations really were. It's all just hypothetical. Another debunking of William's findings came from Mayanist David Stewart, who said that the object identified on the satellite imagery is nothing but an old cornfield. His claim was supported by an expedition that took place near the area in 2021, when the archaeologists present reported there was nothing at all in this area. Still, a 15-year-old boy almost found a long-lost Mayan city, which is pretty exciting if you ask me. Similar techniques as those used by William are actually being used to unearth lost civilizations all over the world. According to space archaeologist Sarah Parquet, satellite imagery has been a key player in discovering ancient cities in Egypt and other places. Sarah herself spends most of her days scouring images for any sign of where there could have been cities long ago. What happens, she says, is that any time you have something buried, it's going to be covered either by vegetation, soil or sand, or some other modern construction on top of it. In order to assess whether there is something hidden under large canopies of vegetation or not, she uses infrared technology, for instance. A major recent discovery in Brazil was done in a similar way. Satellite imagery detected a network of trenches dating back to 200 to 1200 CE. These suggest settlements that could have supported around 60,000 people. But in this case, the satellite imagery did indeed correspond to what was on the ground. Researchers from the University of Florida found several mounds that were accompanied by ditches and geoglyphs. 
archaeologists also found remnants of carefully designed walls, centered around plazas, much like the type of construction done by the ancient Mayans. Advances in satellite tech have also shed new light on long-discovered ancient Mayan cities, such as Tikal. Located in the heart of the Guatemalan jungle, Tikal is believed to have been the capital of the ancient Mayan Empire. At its height, it was comparable in importance to cities such as London or New York in today's world. It was composed of a series of complex monuments, many of them believed to have been the resting places of kings and chiefs. Tikal is already known to have been big, but recent discoveries show it could have been even three times larger than what scientists originally believed. The main discovery revolves around a fortification on the outskirts of the city, indicating how far the original city stretched. And new discoveries still take place. In 2017, researchers also unearthed new clues regarding the potential causes of the decline of the Mayan civilization. Using data from a site in Siwol, located 62 miles southwest of Tikal, Scientists analyzed radiocarbon data from ceramics and archaeological excavations to extract new information about the sudden demise of this great civilization. The information shows that, instead of a sudden collapse, the Mayans most likely collapsed in waves of social instability and political crises. These events are believed to have deteriorated Mayan city centers and began causing the dispersion of the Mayan population. Well. Wow. It seems like it's a prime time to uncover ancient ruins. What do you say? Will you give it a try as well? Endless hot deserts seem lifeless at first glance. But among these sands, you can meet dangerous and sometimes creepy creatures. Some of them can only cause health problems, but some can stay in your memory forever. Let's get to know them. Starting with dangerous ones and finishing with real nightmares. So, you're walking through a desert and see a big teddy bear with open hands. You understand that it's probably a mirage, but still, you come closer. You were right. It's not a plush toy, but a giant cactus. There's something strange about it. Thanks to some strange fluff, the branches resemble the arms of a teddy bear. However, this is not fluff but thousands of thin needles, and they are the reason you shouldn't come closer. The cactus is called the Jumping Choya, or Teddy Bear Choya. It grows in the desert areas of Arizona and in the northern part of Mexico. Don't worry, this cactus won't attack you, but it will cling to your skin or clothes if you touch it. Such a fur coat protects the cactus from animals, creates shade, and saves it from heat. The lateral branches are the most important parts of the plant as they carry out photosynthesis and accumulate a large amount of moisture inside. So, despite all the danger, the cactus can be helpful for desert wanderers. And the danger here is needles. If you look closer at them, you will see they have the shape of hooks. One touch, and hundreds of thorns are already in your finger. It's pretty difficult to get rid of them and the needles cause unpleasant, painful sensations. But the coolest thing about this cactus is the way it reproduces. The plant clones itself in a new place. When animals and people pass the jumping choya and touch it, the cactus gives them a small piece of itself along with the needles. As soon as you throw this piece to the ground, it takes root and starts growing. The degree of danger is rising. The next monster from the desert is running toward us, and that is an ostrich. Many think these animals are cowards hiding their heads in the sand. You will most likely change your mind if you're unlucky enough to meet one. Usually, ostriches are not aggressive, but you should run if you come closer to their nest. On the other hand, you won't be able to do that because ostriches move at a speed of 43 miles per hour. You need a car to get away from them. They run and hit their enemy with their chests. There have been cases when ostriches attacked vans and caused significant damage to them. But the main danger these birds present is their powerful legs with sharp claws. They can deliver strong blows with them and even beat a prone opponent. So yes, if you see an ostrich in the distance, go the other way. 
This small spotted lizard lives underground almost all the time in the arid deserts of the southwestern U.S. and northwestern Mexico. Sometimes, it goes outside to find lunch. It only seems cute, but in fact, it's a dangerous gila monster. Its thick skin protects the reptile from hawks, coyotes, and other predators. But its main protection is its venom. Snakes and spiders inject their toxins using long, needle-like fangs. The gila monster clamps down and chews the prey to spread the venom. And when it bites a person, it can keep its jaws closed for a long time. Getting rid of the animal is a tricky feat. People who have experienced the effects of the venom say it feels as if hot magma passes through the veins. Despite this, the lizard turned out to be useful for science. Doctors used its venom to create medicines for diabetes and obesity. The time has come. Now you're about to meet one of the creepiest creatures living in the desert. Be quiet and listen to the silence. Stand still, there's no one around. Suddenly, you hear some hissing coming from below. You lower your head and see it. A big yellow spider the size of a human palm with strong jaws and long legs hides in the shadow of your body. In horror, you run away from this monster, but it goes after you. It isn't easy to do it in this situation, but try to calm down. The creature isn't interested in you. It wants only your shadow to hide from the scorching sun. Anyway, it's better not to touch it. The powerful jaws of the camel spider can cause unpleasant sensations, to put it mildly. And, by the way, this creature isn't really a spider. Yeah, it belongs to the class of arachnids, but it's a separate species, Salpigid. It likes to bite. It's fearless and pretty aggressive. The spider preys on insects, lizards, rodents, and small birds. It can also move at a speed of 10 miles per hour. For their small size, this is very fast. You need to be a professional athlete to run away from it. Most often, you can find camel spiders in the deserts of the Middle East, but they also live in Mexico and the southwestern U.S. These runners are nocturnal and try to avoid the sun during the day, so they are always hunting your shadow. By the way, they got their name because they often hide in the shadows of camels. You won't hide from them during the day, but they will also want to come after you at night, especially if you make a fire. Solpugids always run to the light in the hope of eating something. Some species of these spiders make a hissing sound to scare their enemies away. Now, let's calm down for a second and leave the hot desert. We're going into the humid tropics of Tanzania. Under tree bark, fallen leaves, and in dark caves, you can meet one of the most terrifying creatures on Earth, a tailless whip scorpion. Imagine a big scorpion without a tail with a flat body that looks like it has been pressed by something. It's similar to spiders, but has no venom glands and can't spin a web. This monster is silent and fast, but the scariest thing is its two front claws, twice as long as the creature itself. Any prey it catches will never escape. Life in a dark cave has spoiled its eyesight, so the whip scorpion tries to avoid sunlight. During molting, it climbs up to the ceiling and slowly comes out of its old skin. Imagine directing your flashlight there and seeing small cocoons out of which pale spiders with excessively long legs crawl. If you really meet it, be calm and slowly go away as far as possible. Be careful. The flat scorpion can crawl under your clothes in a second and bite you in the stomach. And that's not the worst part. Okay, this is a joke. This pretty guy is one of the shyest and most harmless creatures among spiders and scorpions. It's afraid of you and will never attack. Many consider it beautiful and keep whip scorpions in glass terrariums. If you want such a pet, carefully watch it so that it doesn't run away from its house. If it happens, it will be pretty challenging to catch it again. In a matter of moments, it can get under your bed or go through gaps in the floor. Then it'll go to your neighbor's apartment through a ventilation system and scare people there. Okay, how about one more scorpion? 
It's not as creepy as the other creatures in this video, but it's the most venomous scorpion in the USA. This is the Arizona bark scorpion. The problem is that you can see it in the desert, in your home, or in the yard. These dangerous venomous beasts crawl into rooms and often sting people. One time is enough to cause pain, similar to a bee sting. But someone with an allergy may experience paralysis, breathing problems, and other health issues. Researchers have found almost 1,000 previously hidden Maya settlements in the tropical lowlands of what is now northern Guatemala. They did it with LIDAR, light detection and ranging lasers, which they used to scan areas from the air. The region we're talking about is pretty vast. All those structures and buildings they saw over there stretch across about 650 square miles. And these spots were supposedly occupied thousands of years ago. It seems all these structures were pretty densely packed, so people lived close to each other. They had at least 417 ancient villages, towns, and cities where they could identify boundaries. These structures and buildings were actually a part of a state that looked like a kingdom. Some of these settlements were built as sports courts, civic, ceremonial, and religious centers, and residential homes. There were also massive palaces, platforms, dams, pyramids, and causeways across that area. People who lived there also had reservoirs where they collected water. So, they needed the power to organize thousands of specialists and workers. And they also needed many skilled people to build such structures without the technologies we have today. They needed lime producers, architects, mortar and quarry specialists, lithic technicians, those who took care of legal enforcement, and other important roles to establish the true community. This cool laser scanning system researchers used while exploring this area can even penetrate very dense ecosystems and vegetation. The light bounces off different surfaces and then creates a digitally reconstructed map. This map is based on how much time it takes for the pulses to get back to a receiver. So, with this laser system, they discovered they were also lowlands for agriculture. So why exactly did the Maya settle in this region? It was a specific area. Plus, it was hard to build such an amazing kingdom in a tropical rainforest climate. Back in the old times, ancient peoples had mostly inhabited areas in drier climates. Over there, they would build water resources, which were some sort of the basis of society and a source of life. An example of this is Teotihuacan of Highland, Mexico, although they did have a couple of navigable rivers they could use for transport and trade. But these rainforest areas had their advantages too. The Maya used natural resources like limestone, which was their primary building material, salt, and the volcanic rock obsidian, which they used for different tools. Also, they managed to find enough dry land to live and build homes there. The lowlands were seasonal swamps called bajos, and they were perfect for agriculture because of the fertile soil. Generally, the Maya built settlements that could endure rainy periods too. They were ready for different circumstances, including flood and drought, which is something you could see in how they built houses. Their architecture was also one piece of evidence that showed their community was like a centralized kingdom-like state, which shows they stuck together through tough times. The Mayan Empire was very powerful, and it reached its peak about the 6th century CE. They were excellent at pottery, agriculture, writing, mathematics, and calendars. They were the ones who created complex calendar systems, such as the Calendar Round, which is based on 365 days. Although some believe the Mayan calendar predicted December 21st, 2012 would be the end of the world, it was just a coincidence with the end of a certain full cycle. They would call it the Long Count Calendar, and it lasts 5,125 years. The Mayan people left behind an impressive amount of astonishing architecture and symbolic artwork. Most of their stone cities ended up abandoned by 900 CE. No one still knows why the Mayan civilization in that area collapsed, although there are some theories. Some think that by the 9th century, these people had exhausted the resources around them to the point that they could no longer feed and sustain such a big population. Others believe some city-states didn't get along that well, 
so they broke down the traditional system of power they used to have. Some say it was all because of a very long period of drought. It could be a combination of all these factors, though. But one Mayan city, located on an island, even survived until the 17th century. It was long after the rest of the Mayan civilizations had been destroyed or abandoned. If you're a traveler, you might know the town by its modern name, Flores. Scientists believe about 2,000 people lived there. The earliest Maya people were farmers. They cultivated crops like beans, squash, corn, and cassava. As they had many interesting ingredients, they created hundreds of cool recipes. Many of those are still present even today. For example, in modern Mexican cooking, and especially popular are papayas, cacao, avocados, squash, pineapples, chili peppers, beans, and so on. Even though the Maya mostly practiced a kind of primitive type of slash and burn agriculture, there is also evidence of them using some more advanced farming methods, like terracing and irrigation. And they were big chocolate lovers. More than 3,500 years ago, the Olmecs of Mesoamerica probably turned out to be the first to realize that it takes some work for us to get such a cool thing as chocolate. But the Maya were the ones who turned it into a true form of art. Scientists found out about it when they found cacao in Mayan pottery. Their chocolate would be mixed with honey, water, cornmeal, and chili peppers. That's how you get a spicy, savory, hot chocolate beverage you can try even today in Mexico and Central America. Also, they used written language in their books. Their paper was made from fig tree bark, and using strips of that paper, they created a large library of books. Books made of this material are called codices, and four of these can still be found today. Sadly, many books were lost over time because of the humid climate or some human factors. The classic Maya built a bunch of palaces and temples that had a stepped pyramid shape. They decorated them with inscriptions and reliefs, which have earned them the reputation of being incredible artists of Mesoamerica. For the Mayans, flat foreheads were the most desirable thing on someone's face. They were generally really into aesthetics, and having a flat forehead was one of the main things where you could meet their highest aesthetic standard. They also liked to glam up their looks with makeup and clothing. Also, the Mayans were master tattoo artists. Actually, they were one of the first civilizations that started doing such forms of body art. They had a rich culture and believed in many things, such as fairies. Many civilizations across the globe believed in these mythical creatures, which had different names everywhere. The Mayans called those creatures aluxes. They would make sculptures of aluxes from wood or clay, take them to the forest, and hide in some secret spots. The Maya believed these sculptures would come to life during the night and take the role of guardians of their land, animals, and crops. The Maya believed caves were entrances that led to the underworld. You can even visit some of these caves if you like. For example, you can explore the jungles of Quintana Roo and Yucatan near Cancun. There are many spots where researchers found artifacts the Mayans had left behind. They were one of the first cultures that learned how to use rubber latex and make, for example, rubber balls for the many interesting games they had. They used natural latex and then probably mixed it with some other natural substances. That's how they came up with the bouncy balls they played with. They also built cool steam baths. The Maya had structures made from stone that looked like something we know today as bathtubs. Plus, they were building heated stone structures we know as sweat houses. Researchers found these in El Salvador and Guatemala, and they were previously hidden under volcanic ash. <laughs>